wherever you may hail i'm your host john bruni welcome to the focus where we bring you the most thought-provoking and informative current affairs analysis from around the world each episode we invite top experts and analysts to share their insights on the most pressing issues of our time join us as we explore the complex and ever-changing landscape of the world where we provide valuable perspectives on the events that shape our global community Continuing on with our examination of international security, in this episode, we'll be looking at Yemen. Joining us for this topic is returning guest from Washington, D.C. in the United States, Hisham Alumezi. Hisham is a senior advisor for the European Institute of Peace, and he was formerly a captive of the Houthis. But before we start... A shameless plug for ourselves. Please subscribe to our channel. We need the algorithm to find us. And by hitting the subscribe and like buttons, this is your contribution to the growth of what hopefully will become a South Australian global sensation. Hisham, welcome back to The Focus. Thank you for having me. Always happy to talk to you. Thank you. Hisham, it's been a while since we last spoke. So can you please remind our audience under what circumstances you were captured by the Houthis and for how long were you detained by them? Sure. Uh, well, I was basically uh, promoting a peace narrative uh, back at the time when I was in Yemen. And uh, I was becoming exceedingly critical of what they've been doing internally because they wanted everybody to oppose the Saudi-led uh, campaign, military campaign in Yemen and exposing uh, the crimes that have been committed back then, but I also wanted to look internally, inwards, basically, to what the group was doing inside the country itself. Uh, there's been a massive campaign of uh, crackdown uh, on the opposition locally, and uh, they've been uh, they've also had their own bombing campaign against governorates inside the country, uh, arresting people, um, uh, detaining them, torturing them, and uh, when I became exceedingly critical of their ways internally, uh, they picked me up and they forcibly disappeared me for about five months and a half. Uh, luckily uh, for me, uh, I had a lot of friends uh, internationally who pressed, they launched this massive campaign. Uh, they talked to governments, they talked to organizations like Human Rights Watch, like uh, Amnesty International. And then this international campaign put pressure on the Houthis to release me. I was just going to say, uh, so while you were detained, and I know it's a terrible thing to ask you, but uh, I'm sure our audience will be curious, how would you describe your treatment while in Houthi captivity? It was terrible, as you can mm -hmm. imagine. I was put on one of the most uh, notorious prisons in Yemen. Uh, it's called the Political Security Organization. That's where you throw people and you forget about them. A lot of people end up dead in, those, in that kind of prison, or you come out of that with a disability, or uh, in a lot of instances, uh, people lost, literally lost their minds. They walked out of there uh, into an insane asylum. Wow. Uh, so the, the conditions were, were really terrible. I was put on a solitary confinement. And uh, uh, I don't want to overshare, but there were instances that I wished uh, that I would die while I was in there. Wow. Be because That's... the stimulate conditions where you're, they're buried, the, the, the cells are underground. And for a period of time, I was set in, in, in a very dark room in my cell. They didn't have lights there. So they want to simulate uh, the feeling of being buried alive. They're so, very creative. Uh, they're very, very, they're very creative indeed. <laughs> uh, but again, uh, despite what I went through, I consider myself one of the lucky ones. A lot of people didn't make it out alive. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm lucky in that sense. Absolutely. Look, uh, uh, Hisham, Considering your own personal experiences, what's your assessment of the Houthi leadership? I mean, do you think they are pragmatic and calculating, or is it radical and prone to poor judgment? Oh, they're extremely radical and prone to poor judgment and insane mm. judgment, yeah. <laughs> uh, being honest. Uh, this is the thing. This is a group that uh, launched their campaign based on a religious idea, and an extremist religious idea. And on the belief 
that the descendants of the Prophet should rule the country and should rule the world, in fact. And hence why the group is expansionist. Uh, they controlled a remote part of Yemen, but gradually, and not because they're strong uh, inherently, but because the Yemeni government was weak. Uh, and they managed to fill a vacuum during 2011, during the Arab Spring and the failure of the central government. So they basically hijacked, they found an opportunity and they hijacked government institutions. And they played their cards right, and they expanded into other regions of the country, and now they control about half the country. And the thing is, there's, there's a potential for them to control more because the Yemeni government remains to be very weak and divided. And this is one of the reasons why, for instance, when they attacked uh, ships in the Red Sea, uh, there was an international coalition to push back, not the Yemeni government. Yeah. Because the Yemeni government still is very, very weak. And now the international community is relying on multiple coalitions to push back the Houthis and kind of put a dent to their operations in the Red Sea. Hisham, can you tell our audience why the Houthis have thrown in their lot with Hamas in Gaza post October 7, 2023? Well, ideology, that's a very excellent question because in terms of ideology, they're different from Hamas. Yeah. They have different sets of beliefs, they have follow different sects of Islam. But the thing is that they uh, capitalized on this opportunity where the whole world basically ignored Gaza. And realizing that emotions are heightened in the region, that people beyond Gaza, in, in the Middle East and the Arab world, and the Muslim world at large, people are angry that nobody's doing something to come to the aid of Gaza. So Houthis did not essentially come to the aid of Hamas, they came to the aid of the Gazans, the Palestinians. So they projected this image that they're the champions of the Muslim nation, the champions of the weak, uh, uh, because they have their own interests, their own Houthi interests. They, 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 they wrote that wave of discontent with the international community and the lack of action in Gaza and pitched themselves as the vanguards of the Muslim, the Arab nation. Now, the Houthis have their own sets of goals. They're doing this, not because, of course, the, 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 a big part of this is because they want to help the Palestinians, but also because they have their own um, selfish uh, interests they want to distract from what's happening locally because lately they have been losing a lot of popularity locally because of the misstate, uh, mismanagement of the state affairs, because of the corruption, because of the oppressive means. So they wanted to distract uh, from those things by saying, now is not the time to fight internally and criticize us. Now is the time to fall in place and stand for Gaza, one. Two, they're also want to extract more concessions from neighboring countries, specifically Saudi Arabia. Because right now they're in peace talks with Saudi Arabia. They're uh, under the UN auspices. Uh, they're planning a roadmap uh, that basically will give them more power, more money, co control of over uh, more re local resources, natural resources. And they want to extract more concessions by basically telling the region and the Saudis, they're flexing their muscles and basically telling them, we can be a pain in your side, if you don't give us more. And here is how we will be a pain uh, by basically not just uh, attacking cross border attacks with Saudi Arabia, but also debilitating one of the most important waterways in the region, which is the Red Sea region, and uh, blocking ships and becoming a nuisance. But it's not just for the Saudis, but also for the international community. They're telling the international community that here we are, we're pretty powerful, and uh, if we don't get our way, we can make life miserable for everybody else. So really what we're, what we're seeing in that whole Gulf of Aden, Red Sea area is Houthi extortion. That's all we're seeing. Yes, uh, they're capitalizing yeah. on, on the situation and they're saying, you know, uh, basically, if you don't give us what we want, uh, <laughs> we derail everything, uh, trade, security, uh, peace in that region. But also, you have to remember that it's also... Iranians are supporting the Houthis. So Iran also has a vested interest in the instability in that region. And it's a very low cost way to basically uh, irk the international community because they're acting through a proxy. It's, a, it's an indirect fight. And uh, again, the Houthis, they don't have uh, 
technology, the capacity, the training, the manpower, and all, well, they do have the manpower, but the technology, they don't have that. So there's been a lot of technological transfer from Iran to Houthis. There's been a lot of people uh, from the RGC, RG, IRGC, the Iranian RGC, uh, sending trainers. Hezbollah is also joined the, sending trainers to Yemen to basically build the capacity of the Houthis. And now they're using all of that to harass the ships uh, with ballistic missiles, with the surface and subsurface uh, drones in the Red Sea. And uh, you'll see more advanced weaponry, which is essentially Iranian, being used in the Red Sea soon enough. I'm curious, um, talking about the military aspect of things, how did the 2015 Saudi Emirati intervention into Yemen force the Houthis to rapidly adapt to new tactical and operational procedures? And obviously, you know, there is the guiding influence of Iran here as well, as you just mentioned. So what was the initial intervention something that the Houthis cut their teeth on? Because they are a non-state actor after all, and they had pretty slim pickings in terms of technological prowess prior to this entire intervention from, from Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, right? Yes. Uh, but here's the thing. The Houthis had help from the Yemen army that was very well trained, and they right. had access to a lot of weapons, including fighter jets. The previous regime led by Abdullah Saleh, for a period of time, allied with the Houthis. They gave him access to a huge stash of weapons and to army, uh, to the Yemen army, basically a lot of generals, a lot of people who actually were trained in, in the U.S. And they threw the lot, they threw their lot with the Houthis. They managed to withstand the Saudi intervention because of that. And of course, the Saudi-led intervention, and if we're being frank here, it wasn't very well planned. There were a lot of missteps. And this is one of the reasons why for over eight years, they, they, they couldn't push the Houthis out of Sana'a in, in a lot of areas. They mismanaged that operation. Uh, in fact, they created uh, resentment uh, in, within the local population in Yemen because that coalition, in a lot of instances, they bombed schools, they bombed infrastructure, they bombed orphanages, they bombed hospitals, including MSF hospitals inside the country. And that actually had a complete opposite uh, in, uh, reaction with the population where a lot of people were sympathizing more with the Houthis, and it actually enhanced the Houthi recruitment drive. So uh, it, 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 it was also, honestly, it was bungled up. And uh, again, today we see the same thing right now, for instance, uh, because now the coalition, which Australia is also participating in, uh, and now uh, because that coalition, a lot of people completely reacted to the events in Gaza. They're thinking in their mindset, and this is the, the narrative that the Houthis has successfully, unfortunately, managed to craft, is that we are standing up for Palestine, and now this international coalition is punishing us for it. So they use that narrative with the local population in Yemen, but also the Middle East and internationally. And because of that, the people who sympathize with Gaza are now also sympathizing with the Houthis. They think the Houthis are basically the David standing up to Goliath. Yeah. And they're supporting them. It was quite a surprise to me when I was walking uh, here, for instance, uh, in the US, and also uh, it happens in, in, in Europe, uh, a lot of people are, uh, are praising the Houthis for that position, for standing up uh, for Gaza, but also for standing up to this international coalition. Unfortunately, they don't know who the Houthis are. The goals and uh, other ulterior objectives of the Houthis. And uh, locally, over the past few months, they've managed to recruit something like 45,000 people, new additional recruits to their cause, because they managed to hijack the narrative, but also craft this rhetoric uh, that they're the underdog and they're standing up not just for Yemen, but for Muslims, the Palestinians, but also the Muslims at large. Wow, you paint a very complicated and awful picture here. Um, you know, last time we spoke, we were focusing primarily on the humanitarian disaster that was Yemen back then, and arguably still is Yemen today. 
Is there a sense of irony at the moment that, uh, you know, Yemen, a country of such great humanitarian catastrophe over the last 20 odd years, is now backing another humanitarian disaster, which is arguably Israeli sponsored in Gaza? I mean, is there is there not a sense of very dark humor that can be sort of pushed forward on this kind of issue? And and really, because the international community is so focused on what the Israeli defense forces are doing in Gaza, does it not also distract from the local issues within Yemen, which are still at crisis point? They haven't gone away as far as I understand. No, you're absolutely right. There is definitely an irony in that. The thing is, they also, again, they man managed to frame it in a way, the Houthis, in telling their people and their followers that even though we're suffering, we have a humanitarian crisis, but um, we have a moral obligation right. to stand with our brethren in Palestine. Yeah. We're willing to sacrifice even more to do that. And that actually played really well. That resonated really well with the local audiences because now you walk into Sana'a and in other places and you find people saying, yes, I'm starving, but because they're being constantly bombarded with the stream of imagery that is coming out of Gaza, uh, they're thinking they're in a much worse position than we will ever be in Yemen. Um, it is our duty as Muslims, as Arabs, as human beings to basically stand with these people in Palestine despite what we're going through. Because it, it's 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 they're going through a hell that we have a sense of, but it's it's a lot worse than that we've been through over the past nine years. So, and I'll be honest with you, the Houthi propaganda machine is actually pretty strong and pretty robust, and they know how to play on these kind of keywords in doing these uh, compare and contrast things, and they milk and they weaponize these grievances in a very excellent way. You, you know, listening to you makes me wonder about what happens uh, among the policymakers in Tel Aviv. Now, we understand that it's all very ideologically driven with the Netanyahu government being as it is. Um, but you would have thought that the sort of actions that the IDF was going to create in Gaza would have had the sort of re counter reaction from the Arab world, but elements of the Arab world, for instance, would be, you know, looking to try to leverage uh, against what the IDF is doing. Why do you think they muffed this one up so badly? Because, I mean, even as far away as we are in Australia, it's pretty obvious that if the Israelis would have gone in hard after Hamas, that other unintended consequences, for instance, the Houthis marshalling their forces and starting to attack shipping in the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea areas, may very well have been a likely probability. I mean, I, I don't know why, you know, the Israelis may have missed this. I mean, they have got a very good intelligence service, right? Yes, they do. They do, actually. That's the thing. There's that. There, there was like... <laughs> uh, I don't want to say a misstep, but they they bungled up, bungled up their their intelligence back at the time. But the thing is that there was a missed opportunity. There was a very uh, there was a, a case to be made back then if they had retaliated specifically to Hamas. But the way that that they re retaliated retaliated and uh, implemented a collective punishment against the Palestinians, they lost that moral edge. The Arabs, going back to your issue, the Arab countries. They have, they they operate within a totally different calculus. If you, you have to remember that over the past few years, there's been a push for normalization uh, with Israel. Yeah, and they they've gone a long way uh, in terms of normalizing with Israel. Even Saudi Arabia was discussing normalization after the UAE, Bahrain, and the other the other countries did so. But and they don't want to drop the ball completely, so they're giving Israel a longer leash. But you also have to remember that a lot of these Arab countries, they did not agree with Hamas from even before the conflict. Yes, that's right. Correct. So it, that relationship was very complicated. So they too don't want Hamas there, but they can't uh, be seen, especially with their constituents, they can't be seen as throwing their lots behind Israel. Right. While also at the same time, they cannot withstand the anger, the local anger buildup with what Israel is doing against the Palestinians, which is insane, honestly. 
I mean, I've been through all, I've been bombed. I've seen what happened in Yemen. I was on ground zero and it does not compare to what's going on in Gaza. It pales in comparison. But this is one of the reasons why you see uh, a lot of people in the region, they're forbidding, for instance, mass protests in support of Gaza because they understand that the people are angry but once they allow that, it might snowball into political instability within their own countries. So they're trying to kind of push down on that. They don't want another scenario like Yemen. They don't want another, they don't want a spark that would uh, lead to another Arab Spring in the region. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so they're trying to contain it to a degree. And this yeah. is why you see all the Arab leaders are now kind of pushing for a ceasefire, uh, pushing for more humanitarian aid coming in, but nobody's talking about a military intervention, although they have the, they, they have the, the means to do that. But no, nobody wants to escalate to that line. I was just going to say, uh, Hisham, do the Saudis and the Emiratis still have military forces inside of Yemen? Uh, very smaller footprint than they had before, but they still do. Yeah. Uh, I, I was going to say, you know, uh, initially when the, uh, when the uh, hostilities started, I was wondering why the Saudis, who have probably the greatest interest in tamping down the Houthis, were not moving against them. Because, I mean, effectively, all they need to do is roll the tanks back over the border and they're there. Or if they had military forces on the ground, they could take out command and control assets uh, in situ. But they chose not to go ahead and do anything, which you know demonstrated a couple of things. Firstly, the Saudis probably... Uh, didn't feel confident in their capacities to move forward, you know, after having been in Yemen for such a long time and not really achieving their end point objectives. Um, the only way that you could actually defeat the Houthis, if def military defeat is the only option that you've got on the table. And if you look at the West, and as you know, being in DC, it's all about what, how can we defeat the Houthis militarily? You need to have boots on the ground. There is no other option. You can't just, you know, fire missiles from a, a place in the ocean, many miles uh, off the coast. You know, you need to be able to put people on the ground to take out physically the infrastructure of the Houthi army or, or the Houthi militias, I should say. So uh, how does how does that all work? Well, the Saudis for the past two years, I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, for the past two years, uh, they've been uh, kind of crafting this exit strategy from Yemen. Yep. They've been hemorrhaging a lot of resources over the past nine years. They've been paying off a lot of people in the Yemeni government. They've been selling a lot of weapons, weapons that ended up with the Houthis. Uh, they've been uh, trying to extricate themselves from Yemen at any cost. And this is one of the reasons why they have uh, a lot of negotiations uh, that are sponsored by Oman uh, for the past uh, year and a half almost now, uh, where they just want to shut down that southern border, ensure that there's a buffer zone that protects Saudi interests, and then whatever happens in Yemen stays in Yemen. And this is one of the reasons why when the crises happen in the Red Sea, they refuse to join the coalition because they do not want to antagonize the Houthis. They've been working really hard to kind of sign a peace agreement with the Houthis. So, and, and they're definitely not going to roll back in their tanks because they've done that, been there, and they paid a hefty price for that. They could not defeat the Houthis. Uh, and we've said this in the past, uh, Yemen to the Saudis has been, basically was their Vietnam. Yeah. And they want to end that. They will not uh, get involved in Yemen again. And they actually uh, were pretty clear in warning others from doing the same thing and making the same mistake. Hisham, can you give our audience an idea of what Yemen was like prior to the Hamas attack on the 7th of October 23? Uh, was there some form of stability and reasonable governance emerging in the Yemeni capital, Sana? Unfortunately, no. The Houthis, they, they hijacked the state institutions and initially, when they came into power, they basically promised reform, equality, uh, less access, and uh, all of that, uh, the whole package. But when they came into power, uh, with time, uh, they've proven themselves to be much worse than the previous regime. There was a lot of nepotism. Uh, one of the main, uh, basically, slogans was, no nepotism, uh, no cronyism. Uh, this is going to be democracy. But as soon as they took power, uh, Abdul Melkar Houthi and his family 
started basically appointing their own family members, people who have zero experience into positions of power, into ministries, and they created a parallel shadow government, something they call the popular committees. And uh, over the past few years, uh, right before the attacks, uh, the October attacks, it has gotten so bad that uh, people, uh, almost 82% of the population needed one, one form, uh, one form of aid or the other. And people were fed up. Uh, people were basically calling out the Houthis, even from within the Houthi controlled areas, and saying, you are much worse than all the previous regime combined. <laughs> and uh, you've brought poverty, you, you brought uh, ignorance, uh, nepotism, you, you brought depression, and uh, we really want you out. But the thing is, to a lot of people in Yemen, even back then, uh, they didn't have an alternative. The Yemeni government literally failed in putting themselves as uh, the people that uh, should uh, elect or should vouch for or should run to in, in the liberated areas. The situation in the liberated areas were not better than the controlled areas. They're actually in a much worse condition. Uh, currency exchange rates are higher. Uh, services are worse in liberated areas. And at least in government and con health controlled areas, you had one authority to deal with. But you go to the government controlled areas, there are at least seven to eight parties that control pockets, dominions, and they're fighting each other the whole time. And if you're taken, for instance, like me, if, if I'm forcibly disappeared in liberated areas, you'd have a very difficult time in locating me because you don't know which party took me. Because there's so many militias, so many different uh, and uh, divergent uh, political parties, and it's a mess, it's a royal mess. And this is one of the reasons why I said earlier, part of the strength of the Houthis is not because they're strong, it's because the Yemeni government or the alternative parties are really weak. You, you know, I've had this observation and I was gonna keep this as my last question, but I think it's probably a little bit more apt in the flow of the conversation to raise it now. It appears to an outsider that the political fragmentation within Yemen looks very similar to the kind of model that has been tried and has been shown to fail quite significantly in Lebanon. So in Lebanon, you have one powerful militia group like you have Hezbollah. You've got a bunch of semi-autonomous factions who all hate each other and they also hate Hezbollah group. And then you end up having just a chaotic mess in terms of trying to find central governance. A similar kind of model has now been successfully exported to Yemen, where you've had a massive uh, uh, humanitarian crisis and the Houthis are running the show and you've got all these semi-autonomous groups running around the place. Speaking of which, one of the things that we haven't touched on right now is that, you know, you've got the, the Houthi area, you've got the national government area, but then you've also got the Southern Transitional Council area, which is nominally run by Abu Dhabi, uh, the UAE. So yeah. how do how do that all how, how does that all sort of come together or not? It's not coming together. The Saudis created something called the Presidential Leadership Council a couple of years ago to bring all these various factions under one umbrella, one governing body. But over the past two years, that PLC, the Presidential Leadership Council, they don't have much to show for, uh, uh, honestly. And uh, if anything, uh, they use that as an excuse to strengthen their individual factions, saying that the network, so we'll continue to empower our own people. And they have, they have these factions, they have their own spheres of influence, and uh, they contain, the, they control uh, these contained pockets of influence and regions inside Yemen. It's not a united Yemen in the liberated areas. It's very divided. And especially, and I'm glad you mentioned the SCC, especially in places like the SCC, the SCC is literally calling for secession, for splitting the country in half. While the PLC uh, is pitched as a unifying body to, to uh, basically return Yemen to a state of unity. So you can see there, right there, there's divergent rhetoric and divergent objectives and agendas. But again, and, and I said, and I said this in the past, the PLC, it's not going to really work because all these divergent agendas, you need to get them first to agree on a national plan. 
They don't have a national plan yet. They don't have an end goal yet. It's just meant as a transitional period. But we fell into the trap that we did in back in 2011, 2012, is that even the transitional period is, was, not, was not put on a timetable and on a clear plan. It's just, it was just, they brought people together and they said, let's call this a transitional phase and let's just um, appoint these people and let's see where we get from here. That's not much of a plan. Wow. And just lately, <laughs> uh, on the past couple of weeks, I've been talking to people here in DC and I got a lot of questions and people saying, do you think uh, it would be uh, useful to back the Yemeni government militarily to fight the Houthis? And I honestly, my first response to that was, there are a lot of lessons learned from the Saudis backing a more solid government over the past nine years, and that miserably failed. Today, if you're talking about this, if you're raising this option again, I'll ask you the question, which government in Yemen? We have so many governments in Yemen. Who exactly are you going to train in Yemen? Who exactly are you going to send the tanks for? Are you going to uh, give the tanks or the weaponry and the training to the STC, to the Western Coast Resistance, to the people in Hadamu? Who exactly? We don't have a united front. So it's just another black hole that you're going to be throwing a lot of resources into. And then within a couple of years, you're going to be asking, why haven't they made any advances against the Houthis yet? Why, why is it failing? I will I will be very cheeky here. Now that you're in DC and you're talking to Americans and the Americans seem, uh, you know, um, when it comes to complicated issues in the Middle East, they don't like complexity very much. They don't understand cultural and political nuance. I mean, I think that much of what you've said on this podcast would just go completely over many people's heads because it's like, well, they see them as part of Iran. You know, the Houthis are Iranian. Uh, we got to hit the Iranians to destroy the Houthis. I mean, there are all these narratives that are coming out of the American political and media system, which is telling the world a completely different story from the one that you've just said. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> this leads on to the next question. So many people are talking about the Houthis as just another Iranian proxy, mainly Americans and the Brits. When called upon to give local media commentary on the Red Sea crisis, I've usually described the Houthis as being opportunistically aligned with Iran, but not Iranian puppets. How far off the mark am I in my assessment, Isham? You are on the spot. That is exactly <laughs> And I'm going to be using that, that description from here onwards. There <laughs> They're aligned with Iran, but they're a opportunistic group and yeah. they have their own agendas. They have their own expansions projects. Again, this is one of the reasons, but, but I also, let me qualify that statement. Iran also gives their proxies a longer leash mm -hmm. because it gives them deniability. Of course. This is one of the reasons why Iran says whenever something happens with the Houthis, it's like, ah, we, we can't really control them. Yes, there's some truth to that. And we don't really tell them who to hit and where, they have their own mindset. There is some truth to that. But the thing is, if Iran wanted to pressure the Houthis, they would cut all forms of aid. And it's not just military. They're also sending them a lot of money. Hmm. And they're sending yeah. them a lot of expertise as well. But they would cut that. But going back to what's happening in D.C., and I've seen that also in London, is that people, specifically politicians, they want simple solutions. One of the things, for instance, they always tell me, like, okay, so what, what can we do? Just give us one plan. What can we do? Something quick, fast, and a quick fix. And I always say, there is no quick fix to this. This is something that you plan over the two, five, ten years. Because especially now, there are, there are a lot of people brainwashed in Yemen. You cannot change their ideology with bombs or with solutions with two months military campaign. If anything, you'll further galvanize and radicalize the local population, and you'll push more recruits towards the Houthis. So you need to better understand the roots of the conflict. The main roots of the conflict in Yemen is poverty. It's because of the corruption. It's because do you think that people on the streets would go fight for the Houthis if they had a source of income and they're ha living happy lives in their homes? <laughs> no. A lot of the fighters, they're looking for sources of income. But then they join the Houthis, and then they're brainwashed, and then it's very difficult to dial back from that because now they're radicalized. And this is the thing that we've been worrying for for the past for the past two months is that 
People are not paying attention to how the Houthis are changing. Well, they call it winning hearts and minds, but they're actually changing the people's psyche, their understanding of history, their understanding of religion. They're in, literally indoctrinating them. They're telling people you're fighting the fight of God, the fight of Allah. You're standing up to the strong, to the evil, to the enemies of Islam, to the enemies of Arabs, and they're indoctrinating them in a way that is pretty close to extremist groups like Al Qaeda and, and ISIS. And they're going to schools and doing that to school children. And they've changed the curriculum, by the way, the national curriculum. Any of the have taken control of that and changed it. And they're basically putting these seeds in people's minds. And that will not be changed by bombs. That will not be changed by a military campaign. If anything, it will just galvanize that population. Just because like it does in Gaza. Exactly. <laughs> well, where do you think the Hamas fighters came from? This is a generation that was radicalized over the past 20 years. You know, Hisham, Hisham, you know, I mean, just listening to you, it's like, uh, I'm so glad I'm having this conversation because I've been so frustrated lately. Sometimes I feel as though I'm screaming in the wind when I look at the Middle East. I mean, I've, I've worked and lived there, and I think I know something about how the local dynamics are. And it has never appeared to me to be as the Western media and Western governments portray it. And it is so frustrating to have to try to sit down and unpick this, you know, it's complex, but it's actually quite simple. You know, there are certain things like, you know, what you've just said uh, earlier with regard to, well, what is the real motivation for the Houthis? Well, they've got domestic political problems. They can't govern for one. S certainly poverty is a main driver for the people to move to. I mean, these are not, um, you know, we're not asking people to do rocket science or brain surgery at the higher levels of political policy in, in the West. What we're after is for them to open their ears to someone like yourself to just say, you know what, maybe maybe we need to take a slower approach. Maybe we need to be more considered. Maybe we need to give the Yemenis, the ordinary Joe on the street, or is it a Muhammad on the street? Ah, whatever. <laughs> we need to give the ordinary Yemeni an alternative. Now, give them an alternative. It could be as simple as providing them with well-paid employment. Who's talking yes. about shifting a factory to Yemen? Well, then the security people will come up and say, you can't do that, John, because you need security on the ground in Yemen before anyone wants to invest in that country. But it's a perverse kind of cycle in many ways, because if you don't invest in a country like Yemen, the Yemenis will have no other option but to flock to the colors of the Houthis, and yes. we end up making a bad situation worse over time. Exactly. So there has to be a better way of, a better model. Speaking of which, because now I'm really fired up and angry and I've only had one <laughs> cup of coffee this morning. <laughs> what would you suggest would be the best hmm, path forward in terms of the West understanding this alternative narrative, which is it's diametrically opposed to anything that we currently see in any newspaper? Sure. You know, you, this is, I, I was asked this question before and they, they basically said, how do we counter the hooky narrative? Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about narratives and like winning hearts and minds. And I said, basically, just go into the country, provide the economy, basic services, medicine, food. And I promise you, a lot of people are going to be saying, quits, calling it quits with the Houthis, are going to turn around and try to improve their lives. People in Yemen are looking for prosperity. They want peace. They're exhausted. They're frustrated. They've been through a nine-year-old war, and they're done. They don't want yet another war. But again, if it's forced upon them, Yemenis will fight. If you bring the fight to them, they will definitely fight. And especially if you pitch the fight, as the Houthis are, as an existential one. It's not just about you, Yemenis. It's about a heavenly uh, war against the evil uh, imperialist colonial powers. Then they will definitely fight. Hmm. If you pitch it, as coming to the aid of your Muslim brother, they will definitely fight. If you pitch it as these Westerners trying to control Yemen as well, and the Red Sea, but then they'll have boots on the ground, Yemenis will fight. But if you come in and you say, and this is how you pull the rug from the Houthis, you say, here is how we'll revive the economy. Here's how we'll provide opportunities, job employments. 
here is how we built we'll build factories here is how we'll restore electricity clean water uh basic services everybody's going to be dropping their weapons i mean saying you know what i need to provide for my family and for my kids i need a better life for them i need to secure a future for them i don't want them to die in a war I don't want them to die, like, for instance, the beginning of the war in 2015, mm -hmm. with a bomb from the sky that uh, basically uh, was indiscriminately uh, hitting schools, residential areas, hospitals, or what have you. We don't want that. We don't want a repeat of that. Do you, do you think that if we had that discussion uh, with some power brokers in Riyadh or Abu Dhabi, that they would actually listen to this? Because, I mean, they have had their fingers burned, but they are still interested parties in the future of Yemen, whether it's for stability, secession, you know, they'd need to put their varying interests aside and try to come together in a in a more united fashion, if you will. But if you were to go there and say, listen, what we do is we need some funding to develop this sort of model so we can provide you guys the stability in Yemen that you require for the entire Arabian Peninsula to move up a step. Can we do this? Or do you think that the uh, Saudis and the Emiratis will just say, nah, if I'm not going to bomb something, I'm not interested. You know, those guys are really tough. And, uh, you know, once you start drawing blood on the battlefield, it's hard for you to see uh, the country that you were bombing in a positive light. You know, there are these these sort of inbuilt prejudices that come from war that are very difficult to put to one side, even though common sense would dictate you got to find a different path. I think they would be very interested now. They weren't at the beginning, especially when there were a lot of Yemenis monopolizing uh, access to the Saudis because they had vested interests in the continuation of the war. A lot of Yemeni army generals, for instance, were making a lot of money. Yemeni government officials were making a lot of money. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen those personally, and I know them personally, but I'm not going to be dropping names. But uh, <laughs> the thing is, they were living lavishly abroad on Saudi dime. And they managed to do that by the continuation, by virtue of the continuation of the war, the, of the conflict, because they were getting a lot of stipends, uh, a lot of money. They they go to Saudi um, emirs and leadership and they say, uh, I need uh, $2 million per month uh, to basically arm my men who are fighting the Houthis. They turn around, they take the $2 million, they only give their men about like $100,000 and they pocket the rest. But the Saudis caught on now especially because they noticed that there's, there's literally no progress after nine years and hence the exit strategy. And this is why they're trying to cut their losses now, the Saudis. And they'd be very interested, I would assume, logically, to be to, to listen to people like you and me. And, and okay, how can we guarantee now, not just after signing the deal, and this is why they're seeking this, uh, the current peace deal, but for the next five to 10 years, how do we guarantee that there's no resurgence uh, of a crisis south of the border with the Houthis. How do we guarantee that the Houthis, while well, we cannot diminish the potency of the Houthis locally in Yemen over the next five to 10 years? Because they cannot do that, do that with a military campaign. I, I would assume common sense basically says they'll be very interested. We better get started on a, on a proposal, Kisham. That's all I have to say. Oh, no, I would uh, love to. The sooner the better, the sooner the better. All right, well, anyway, um, uh, since the commencement of US-UK military strikes against the Houthi, uh, against Houthi positions last January, has Houthi military capacity been degraded in any significant way to your knowledge? No, unfortunately, no, if anything, the Iranians have sent them even more weapons, even more sophisticated <laughs> weapons to counter that force. Just last week, they sent them uh, submarine drones, which the Houthis didn't have access to. Right. And this right. happened after the coalition started to uh, try to degrade the Houthis. They put a dent on their operations to a degree in the beginning, but you have to remember the Houthis have gotten really good at hide hiding their weapons over the past nine years when there was a much larger and relentless air campaign by the Saudis. Why doesn't anyone get this? I mean, even but in the military... This is what we're petting me. But so I was first so frustrated when the, when the airstrikes happened and I was like... Uh -huh. Have you learned nothing from nine years of bombardment at a large, much larger scale? The Houthis have gotten really good at hiding their missiles and yeah. these weapon ranges and sorry, well, mountainous ranges, and and they've gotten really good um, 
technical advices from the Iranians of how to disassemble and assemble really quickly in certain areas, how to basically hide the radars. They've gotten really good. And I was like, what we're only doing is you're really falling into the Houthi trap because these attacks are fueling the Houthi propaganda and their recruitment drive locally. Makes you wonder, it's, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it makes you wonder whether or not people have a vested interest in maintaining Yemen as an unstable entity, uh, just another battlefield that they can dump munitions on. I mean, I, I know it sounds awfully cynical on my behalf, but, you know, when you see countries doing the same thing over and over again in various ways and means, whether we're talking about Ukraine or Gaza or Yemen or Lebanon or any other place, and expecting a different result, you know, I mean... What 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 are the what what's the end point here? Is it we're trying to replicate the dysfunctions of Afghanistan, of Iraq? What what is it? What uh, <laughs> we can even go back as far as uh, the Vietnam War, for instance, because basically it's the same it's the same basic template that we keep on dusting off and throwing at our military commanders, saying you go off and do that and see what happens. So we give it a crack for a good twenty five years, and uh, and then the whole system locally turns against. The Western intervention or the Western uh, uh, supported intervention, and that's it. So we lose, and it's just strikingly stupid, if I might it's say good so. For business. Uh, it's good it's, for business, absolutely. The military-industrial complex thrives. Oh <laughs> um, well, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's just, it's just another war. If there were no wars, would you think states would arm themselves up? <laughs> so oh, well. it's, it's pretty good business. Nah. It's, it's good lobbyists. But the thing is that, and they try to strike a balance where uh, it's limited intervention, limited conflict, and we'll get out, we'll have made our sales, uh, hit our caps, and we'll walk out. But the problem is that uh, these things tend to snowball. You create an issue here. Uh, this is how we ended up with Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. This is how we ended up with Daesh and ISIS in Iraq with a limited military intervention. And this is how we're gonna end up with the worst version of from both in Yemen. So you got to be really careful. Uh, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know, Hisham. It seems like I've just forgotten what you've said, like all the other nation states before me. I don't know what's going on. It's so <laughs> weird. It's like everyone's got collective amnesia, you know, and, and it's you know, not that we... Right? It, it's, it's like, I, I can't understand. We've got recent history in this as well. We're not talking 25 years ago. We're talking recent history, and we're still doing the same stupid thing. Anyway. You know. uh, yeah. Look, uh, final question, because unfortunately I've got a dash, but uh, back in 2003 to 04, in a collaborative interdisciplinary program with the University of Adelaide, I led two conferences, one in Australia and one in the UAE, on what was known back then as asymmetric warfare. We predicted that the trend was for smaller states and non-state actors to use innovative, cheap technologies and other non-kinetic means to disrupt the more expensive military technologies of the developed world. And after the war on terrorism, here we are some 21 years later in a military battle space transformed. Houthi fighters are using cheap drones and missiles to completely overturn Western maritime security in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden and the Bab el Mandab. But war, even when run cheaply, is expensive in lives and resources. How long do you think Houthis can keep this sort of pressure up? Do you think they truly believe they can outlast the West in their conflict with them? Oh, they do. Trust me, they believe it. <laughs> uh, especially because they have a huge pool to draw recruits from. Right. And uh, because they are in control of state institutions and they have a tax income from that. So they can continue this for decades. It's very cheap for them. The drones cost them about $2,000. And it's actually quite expensive for the coalition because their bombs run from $1.5 to $2 million per bomb to shoot one drone. And it become, they know that it will become exceedingly expensive for the coalition to maintain their presence and their operations in the Red Sea. So they're actually betting on it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Hisham, it has been a very... Feisty discussion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and happy to talk to you because you know what's happening. Uh, you understand the region. Uh, I mean, I'm in your headspace, mate. I'm in your uh, headspace. Talking to you is very cathartic. 
<laughs> yeah. Anyway, look, Hisham, thank you once again for joining us on The Focus and for sharing your insights. Senior Advisor at the European Institute of Peace and former captive of the Houthis, Hisham Alomazi. If you want to know more about Hisham and about the work he does at the European Institute of Peace, we'll have some extra information for you in our show notes. And to our audience, thanks for tuning into The Focus podcast. We hope that you found today's discussion enlightening and thought-provoking. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to us on social media. You can find The Focus on Facebook, referenced on the John Bruni and Sage International LinkedIn pages, and on Twitter or on the Sage International website, sageinternational.com.au, by clicking the Media Center drop-down menu and hitting Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and or leave us a review on your favorite platform. My thanks to our stalwart production team of Malcolm Hughes and Neil Smart, and to the team at the Ozcast Network. We hope that you'll join us again as we continue to delve into the most pressing current affairs issues of our time. Until then, stay informed and stay engaged. I'm John Bruni, and you've been listening to The Focus.